Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our SETI Live. Uh, so today we are going to talk about a recent discovery made by a team of researcher from UC Berkeley and the European Southern Observatory as well. And I have two of them with me today. So I have Paul Callas. Hello, Paul. Paul is a researcher at UC Berkeley, is an adjunct professor at UC Berkeley, and also a SETI Institute affiliate. Um, I know Paul for more than 20 years now, so we're going to be very relaxed, have a very relaxed conversation. <laughs> it's going to be fun, Frank. Thanks for having me. And uh, with Paul, we have Meiji Nguyen, uh, who is a research assistant at UC Berkeley. Hello, Meiji. How are you? Hi. Happy to, happy to be here, Frank. So, Meiji, you're the first author of this paper, right? Yes, I'm the leading uh, author published in uh, Astronomical Journal. So I'm going to say the title of the paper. First Detection of Orbital Motion for HD 106906b, a wide separation exoplanet on a planet nine-like orbit. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about, basically. So let's go, since uh, I would remind people that they can ask questions during our conversation, and we take the time to answer to their questions, of course, toward the end. And you can also tell us where you are watching us from uh, on this planet or elsewhere, but I'm assuming most of you are on this planet in one of those uh, wonderful continents we have here. So, uh, Paul, um, I know you have been working with Hubble Space Telescope data for a long period of time, um, and this is another exoplanet. So please tell us uh, what this exoplanet is interesting and how did you detect it or how how did you conduct this research? Ah, well, this exoplanet was actually discovered uh, from the ground in 2013 um, from our colleague uh, Vanessa Bailey, who we both work with actually. And um, uh, the funny thing is the Hubble data that we used actually came from 2004 and there were additional data in 2017 and 2018. But the planet was actually seen in 2004 by the Hubble Space Telescope, except we thought it was a background star. And what Vanessa Bailey did from the ground is um, take images of the region um, over multiple epochs or at different times. And it turns out that stars near the sun move relative to background stars. HD 106906 isn't too close to the sun. It's over 300 light years away. Never, nevertheless, it moves. And what Vanessa Bailey discovered is that another point of light, what was thought to be a background star, was moving with 106906. And that's how she determined that this was a planetary mass object. Uh, and uh, what we've been doing is going back to the Hubble archive from 2004 and getting new Hubble data of our own uh, 14 years later, in fact. And that's how we discovered that not only is HD 106906b, that's the name of the planet. There isn't any other name, unfortunately. It was just called 106906b. We discovered that it's not only moving with the star, but it has an additional motion, which is the orbital motion. And it's a very tiny motion. And in fact, the orbital period from our paper, what we discovered is that it's roughly 15,000 years. Good. So that's, um, is that a terrestrial planet or that's a Jovian planet? What kind of planet are we talking about here? Uh, Meiji, do you want to take that one? Uh, of course. Uh, so it's actually uh, quite a large planet. And so it's definitely a gas giant. It's 11 Jupiter masses. And so it's almost on the edge of even being a brown dwarf. Um, so it's quite massive. And so this one is orbiting very far away from its star. Uh, the number I got from my paper is 740 AU. That's uh, right. That's something very weird for a planet. I mean, we don't have planets like this in our solar system, right? Uh, not at all. Well, I mean, so, so we think. Um, so, but this is what people are searching for. Um, and... We can remind people the, the distance between Earth and Pluto roughly is 45 AU, right? 45 times the distance Earth 
her son. So here we're talking about something which is like even 20 times further away from than Pluto. That's very far. All right. Um, so when you see this tiny dot moving, and I, uh, Meiji, you have a picture where we can see behind you this tiny dot, and that's basically a picture. That's what we call a, what's called, as astronomer call a picture of an exoplanet. It's just a, a dot. But from this dot, basically what you measure is the motion. And I can see on this figure as well that you derive the kind of an orbit. Can you tell us a bit more about this orbit, Meiji, maybe? Uh, yes. So you can, as you can see in the background here, uh, so this is the planet right here in, in the circle. And this little, um, the, the little circular ring going around the, this, the, uh, the planet is, is the, one of the predicted orbits or a potential predicted orbit uh, that we've measured uh, based on the motion of the planet over the approximately 14 years of uh, observations that we have from the Hubble archive. And so one interesting thing to point out that you can see is that the little um, the disk, the little bright sort of flattened shape right here, uh, that's the debris disk around the binary star that's the host of the system. And you can actually see that the left side of the disk is truncated relative to the other side. And so that was a, a very interesting point that researchers, Paul being one of them, in 2015 were trying to answer um, by imaging um, the system with other instruments like GPI on the Gemini South Telescope in Chile. And um, the big question was, you know, why is the debris asymmetric? And at the time, um, you know, one of the hypotheses was that, well, the planet must be interacting with it somehow in order to you know, stir up the material in the outer disk of the system. Uh, but they didn't really have a, 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 me a measurement of the motion at the time. And so this was really just a conjecture. And so I think what our result has shown is that um, there is now very much strong evidence that the planet is indeed moving and interacting with the disk. Excellent. So I, this is such, I, I read your paper this morning and I say, well, that's a very complex uh, system because in fact, you say the central star, but there is not one star, there is two stars in the middle, right? right? It's actually a binary star. The it's binary quite, system, yeah. which orbit around each other in 50 days, roughly. Right two f type stars so yeah so they're two they're two f type stars and so um so they're so it's a binary so they're uh, two stars f type uh, orbiting around each other i just noticed we, we can see two stars on your diagram right. now i just realized that sorry yeah so they orbit around each the, around the center of mass uh yes and then we have a disk which is asymmetrical and then we have a planet which is gigantic and far away Correct. That's a good summary. Any more surprise that I forgot in this system that, uh, no? All right. So, well, if you look really closely, you can see little, little green aliens just right on the edge of that pixel there. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later. You have to stay online until, uh, until uh, 3.30. Now, before we go more into in details about this system, let me say that we have a lot of people watching us right now uh, from Texas, Irving, uh, Chicago, Lima, Peru, Georgia, USA, Turkey, South Wales in UK, in Ireland, Alberta, Canada, Melbourne, Australia, Chile, Vietnam, Nibiru, Venus. So I see there is people from outside, probably from the phosphine layers at uh, 50 kilometers above the surface of Venus. That's where they're watching us from. Portugal, Michigan, Glasgow, Tampa, uh, Varso, New York City, uh, Florida, Berlin, Malaysia, Belgium, Antwerp, and, and uh, Montreal, or Montreal. I say it, Montreal. Okay, so um, let's go back to this interesting system. I, it's a fascinating, it's fascinating what astronomer can get from a few dots, and I would like for you to explain to us uh, how you derive the orbit of this planet, and maybe don't. But explain to us basically the process because that's the thing it's uh, it will interest our viewers uh yeah in fact this is a really difficult project um because if you think about it uh it has a fifteen thousand year orbit that's what we discovered but we're only uh, we only have 14 years of data so how do you get the type of precision and accuracy in a position measurement 
to find that tiny motion um, over just 14 years. Um, one of the key figures uh, from our paper, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it up in my background, is uh, is this one, and that this one does show the data, and uh, there's sort of a uh, zoom in to where the planet is, and this pixelation actually represents the pixels of the camera, and. In this 14 year time span, the planet moved by less than one pixel. Yes, that's what so I'm saying. So how, I mean, this is the amazing thing. How do you find something moving when it moves only as far as the distance from one edge of a pixel to the other? So uh, there are two things. First, using the Hubble Space Telescope, right? It's above Earth's atmosphere. So it produces some of the sharpest images available. Uh, that are not blurred, that are stable, uh, and you can do exquisite measurements using the Hubble Space Telescope. But then the other thing is, how do we find motion over time? You sort of need a very fine reference grid. If you think about, for example, graph paper, you want very, very fine lines in order to measure a motion. And that grid was provided by uh, a European mission called Gaia. And Gaia's sole purpose is to map the positions of billions of stars to high precision. And these observations are being done now. And we used one of the catalogs uh, that was released by the Gaia project. So actually Meiji was the master of uh, uh, doing all the analysis uh, and the innovation needed to get this measurement. So what Meiji did was uh, find the positions of uh, these background stars along with uh, Rob DeRosa, who is a European scientist down in Santiago, Chile. And uh, they found the positions and they found some of these stars were also in the Gaia catalog. So when we look at our field here, the one behind Meiji and the one behind me, we actually know where all those background stars are to high precision that provides a reference grid uh, that, that is absolutely fantastic. And that's how we measured the motion of 106 b over 14 years, even though that motion is so small, it all fits inside one pixel. Excellent. So from this tiny motion, you basically knew that you found out that the motion of the planet, which is a, uh, I don't know how many arc seconds is that, but it must be very small. You probably it's know. 30 thousandths of an arc second. All right. <laughs> and from this motion, you basically, and maybe, maybe you can explain those orbits, you run a model, right, to kind of fit this tiny motion. And that's all these orbits we see are all the orbits that could, be bas could fit the motion so far. Uh, that is correct. Yeah, so the you'll see on the, the graph behind uh, the figure behind Paul that there's actually not just one orbit like in the figure behind me, but there's actually multiple of them. There's roughly you know, 25 or so. So that's just a representative sample of potential orbits based on like the models that we generate. And so really when we're doing this, we're doing a technique called uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, which basically is just statistics, a fancy way of saying that we generate a sample distribution of all potential orbits it could have. And so we, and we, are really just um, interested in what's the most likely. And so that basically gives us a, a rough estimate. Because you know, in science, we can't just say something. We have to give a, an error bar or uncertainty on our measurement because that's, that's just good practice. And so um, this distribution is basically a representative sample to show that we think that it's basically orbiting pretty close to the star, um, enough so that it's able to like interact with the, the disk, basically. This is why we see the truncation on the Eastern side. But you know, there always is the potential that it's maybe orbiting a little bit farther out, but that's represented in kind of the spread of different orbits that, are, uh, that you see in the figure. So you have, in, I think you have that in the paper, you have all the orbits basically into a diagram where you have the eccentricity, the inclination and all the parameters, right? Correct. And from this, you basically say, okay, this, the orbit is this, has this characteristic plus or minus an error on it. Um, so I look at one of the measurements, which are very important for the paper, is the inclination. The inclination of the orbit with respect to the debris disk. 
And this is a value which is significantly higher than expected. It's 36 or 44 degrees. Maybe one of you want to explain why you have these two families of orbits, if you want to enter in the detail. But that's a significant result of the paper, right? So uh, I can answer the, the the orbit question why there's like two numbers. And so the reason is because, um, so we're doing a measurement of how it's moving basically in the 2D plane that we see the images in. But we don't know how uh, fast it's moving into or out of the sky plane because we haven't measured it's what's called radial velocity. Basically it's motion in the Z axis. And so that's why there's two numbers because potentially it could be more inclined if it's moving farther out or it could be less inclined if it's moving like into the the screen, so to speak. Uh, Paul, do you want to take the other half of the question? Um, so uh, the this inclination is one of the reasons we compared it to the our hypothetical planet nine. So a lot of the the trans-Neptunian objects and Kuiper belt objects are highly inclined relative to the plane of our solar system. That means the orbit is not in the plane of the solar system but out of the plane, inclined. So that's the amazing thing uh, when looking at an exoplanetary system, we can see that the plane of the, that planetary system is sort of edge on along uh, that disk axis. But you can see even by eye that the planet's um, predicted orbit here is inclined by at least 30 degrees. And indeed, that's what makes the comparison to our hypothetical planet nine, because our hypothetical planet nine also is uh, thought to be inclined relative to our own solar system, in addition to being very far away from the sun. Yeah, so this planet nine um, kind of idea came in 2014, right? It was, um, it was a paper published by I uh, forgot how you say his name, Batigen. 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 Yeah. Thank and you. Brown, Constantine Batigen and uh, Mike Brown, who was also a Berkeley student, just like uh, Meiji was actually. So they basically um, infer from the motion, from the distribution of uh, transneptunian objects. And also later on, was, this was also suggested from the distribution of comets, that there is something perturbating in our solar system the motion of those trans objects. And this could be this hypothetical planet nine. Well, we, we don't know not anything about it, except that it will be a very distant body, as you mentioned, and very inclined, and maybe in an extremely eccentric orbit. But we have not yet seen this planet nine. It's kind of, uh, it's something that people have been looking for and we have not seen because it's difficult to see something small, is the size of maybe Uranus or Neptune and far away even if, uh, if it's in our, solar, our own solar system. So what you're mentioning here is that you may have seen the equivalent of planet nine in another solar system. All right, so how this system form? Why, why this planet is inclined? Is that, what's the, what kind of hypothesis do you have for this, uh, for this, plan, for this plan exoplanet nine? Let's call it like that instead of HD 106906b. <laughs> so call it exoplanet nine. And uh, what do you think this could give us as an, as an information for our own planet nine? Uh, so behind me, I've actually put up uh, a figure from that Constantine Mutigan and Mike Brown have put together that kind of shows why they think that the planet nine hypothesis uh, uh, is legitimate. And, and so you can see on the left, uh, or so on the other side, uh, this way, sorry, this way. You can see all these sort of purplish um, pink orbits. And these, those are the objects of various, what are called detached Kuiper Belt objects that are in, in extreme orbits beyond the orbit of Neptune that were discovered in the early 2000s and the 2010s. And they all, one thing that um, they noticed, the people searching, who found these objects was that they were all kind of pointing in one specific direction. Um, they were all kind of clustered together in one uh, region of the sky. And so they, they uh, figured out that had like, you know, they were asking, you know, how do you explain this clustering all these orbits? And so they hypothesized that if you had a massive planet, like a potential planet nine, which is kind of on the other side um, here, you mm -hmm. could then, um, it would help explain why these orbits were all clustered together in one part of the sky. And um, in order to then, and so their prediction from this was that the planet nine is, you know, roughly 
you know, they think it's in roughly 10 Earth masses, uh, has a uh, separation of maybe uh, 600 AU or so, and then also it has an inclination of, you know, 20 to 30 degrees. And so these are all very kind of comparable to what we're measuring uh, with 106 96 b And so that, and it's quite frankly, the only planet that we found that matches these characteristics because directly imaged planets are just hard to find. They're, um, you have to uh, basically image them when they're very young um, and it's therefore very hot still from the heat of formation. And this is why, uh, it's, as you mentioned, it's very difficult to look for a planet in our own solar system because you know, our solar system is four and a half billion years old. Any planet nine would have cooled down long ago um, from its formation. And so if, if it's out there, it's not gonna show up as, you know, it's like a bright, bright point source. It's gonna be very dark. And, it's, and actually I think um, there are various people who are kind of related to the GPI group that I work in who have been looking for planet nine. And one way they're doing it is by what's called like an occultation network. They're actually looking for its effect by it's actually blocking out background starlight and see so you look for a, a body that's you know, moving um, and inferring from this this occultation that there must be like a planet out there yeah the hunt is not yet it has just started and we still did not find this planet nine uh we are getting questions and i uh we don't have much time we have four more minutes so let's take a few questions and then we have a conclusion qu question um uh, someone is very interested in this uh, in this figure you show, Paul. Is the box in the upper right corner of Paul Kala's screen what has been measured so far between 2004 and 2017? Can you confirm? Because that's something that was kind of, I think, I think people are skeptical that we see a motion here. So when you're going to speak, we're going to see the, 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 the screen. Go ahead. Yep, that's right. Um, that is indeed the data uh, from one of our epochs. Uh, so this is from actually 2017. The 2004 uh, image um, has a slightly finer spatial scale. Uh, it's a different instrument and the electronics died. So we don't have it available anymore on the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and, and another thing to note is that this is not showing the planet in reflected light. Um, this is emission from the planet because it's a 15 million year old planet. It's still hot from its heat of formation. So it's still, it's actually glowing at visible and infrared wavelengths. Uh, so that's one difference between searching for planet nine and searching for exoplanets around young stars. Here we can use um, infrared and sometimes visible light techniques to see the thermal emission from a planet, whereas Astronomers have to rely on reflected light uh, to find distant uh, solar system objects like Sedna or Planet Nine. It's good because you just answered to the next question that was about uh, how similar this planet is from uh, compared to Jupiter. So this is a baby Jupiter, basically, 18 million years old. It's really like a very young planet, still hot. And that's why you see it, in fact. Yeah. Our solar system is 4.5 billion years old, so planets like Jupiter are very cool in a way that they are cold, cold temperature. So you don't see them in emission. You see them by reflection only, unfortunately. So we have a very interesting questions here. Have you been looking for other planets orbiting the same type of binary star, star systems? That's uh, actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, so the fact that it's a binary isn't, um, I think, super distinctive, I think. We're, to be honest, astronomers, we're looking for planets around anything, any system we can find. And so I think the fact that this one was a binary just makes it so that uh, it fits that this planet is actually a slightly bigger cousin of our own solar system. So the together, the binary, the combined mass of the two stars is almost three solar masses. And the disk the Dredus of the system is, is actually quite larger than ours as well. So in a way, it almost makes sense that um, H16906b is almost like a larger cousin of a particular planet nine and also our solar system because everything is just like basically scaled up. You know, it's just like everything is more massive. Everything is farther out. There's just much more material involved. What are we going to say, Paul? Oh, no, let's, uh, let's do one more question uh, before okay. time runs out. Uh, one question we have is that from your research and from this, the fact that we infer in the existence of Planet Nine in our own solar system, is it too early to say that every star system 
in our galaxy, in our galaxy, have a planet nine. Has a planet nine? Uh, I think so. Uh, we so far we found one, and this 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 system, and I think that's what makes it unique. And so uh, it definitely, I think, helps strengthen the search uh, for a planet nine runner system because you know for the longest time. You know, there was always people proposing, oh, you know, there must be a ninth planet out there. There must be a ninth planet out there. And people were very skeptical because, you know, we hadn't found anyone, a planet like this anywhere else out in the universe. And so the fact that we now have one, I think kind of helps strengthen the case to keep searching for planets like this. And I think there will be much more common than we currently, you know, uh, believe them to be. But at the same time, I think it's, it's like, it's like the trend in, in all of astronomy, you know, you, there was someone who discovered the first galaxy. They people didn't know they existed before then. There was someone who discovered the first exoplanet. You know, they just won the Nobel Prize for that, but they didn't know they existed before then either. So, who knows? Yeah, Meiji, I think it would be a great, a great PhD uh, research to be uh, inferring the probability of existence of Planet Nine around planetary systems. What do you think? That is a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, so. That's gonna bring me to my my last question. So, what's next for you? You can tell me what next for your research, what next for you in your personal life, what's next for next week, or what next in ten years. But what's the next ne next step for you, Meiji? You want to start? Uh, yes, actually. So, uh, I'm a, I recently accepted a job offer to work as a support uh, uh, data analyst at Space Telescope, the institution that runs the Hubble Space Telescope, and so I think. That would be a great opportunity to actually do follow up on some of these questions using potentially, you know, James Webb, um, Nancy Grace Roman telescope and basically future um, generation telescopes, space telescopes specifically to try to search for other planet nines and um, uh, other, you know, interesting objects in our universe. Congratulations. When are you starting? Uh, in a month or two. Uh, you going to Baltimore so, or you are working remotely? Well, I think we're, we're all working remotely for the foreseeable future. And so they've told me that I can continue to do so, but they're trying to try to phase in people as, you know, as the vaccine becomes available for the general public. What about you, Paul? Well, I think um, the immediate um, impact and next steps for our work on 106 106 is that the theorists are tremendously interested when an astronomer, an observation astronomer comes up with an orbit. Of, of a planet. So I think uh, what's going to happen is that different uh, theory groups are going to take the numbers that we derived for the orbital elements, you know, semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, and so on and so forth. And they're going to start modeling the history of the system. Mm -hmm. And they're going to try to understand in 15 million years, how is it that that 11 Jupiter mass planet ended up over there exactly. And is it true that it actually is able to truncate the disk, the circumstellar disk? And so I think that's what's, uh, what's going to happen over the next year, actually. We'll see more papers on 106, 906. But uh, as far as observers go, we have to keep tracking the planet. So you can see that, as we were talking about earlier, there's an uncertainty in the orbit. It could be any one of these orbits so our job and our duty is to keep uh, observing 106906 and getting those precise measurements of position over time. So uh, in the end, we'll have uh, uh, orbit that we are more confident in. Did you get telescope time to observe it next year? Uh, well, uh, we're gonna apply using the Hubble Space Telescope. Yes, Again. the James Webb Space Telescope is already uh, in its uh, uh, calendar, this is one of the targets it's going to be observing. One oh six. It's part of the of the uh, the Ridic program. How do you call this again? It's a guaranteed time, guaranteed time. observation. So even before the James Webb Telescope is launched, uh, there are a series of very important science programs that are going to be executed. Uh, once the telescope is up in space. And 106, 906 is one of the targets. So it's going to be really exciting. It's a low hanging fruit, basically. Good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for both, uh, to both of you for your time, for spending some time talking to us about your research, this fantastic discovery. Congratulations, Meiji, for this job. I mean, I oh. hope I'm going to cross you pass in person, see you at a conference somewhere. 
Thanks, Paul, again for uh, being available and uh, for joining us and tell us about your fantastic work with the Hubble Space Telescope. Thank you very much, Frank, and everybody from SETI. And I will remind people that SETI Live is presented each week, is part of uh, our outreach program. Uh, we love to share the, the fun and uh, the, the fun of science is part of our mission. So if you want to support the SETI Institute, you can simply join our social media, visit our website, join to receive our newsletter. And of course, if you are feeling generous, you can make a donation, like a Christmas donation for, for the SETI Institute. I wish to all of you a great uh, end of your season and uh, see you soon to talk about space, discovery, exoplanets, whatever you want, something fun and something in space. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.